But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to, the ungrateful and, uh, kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your uh, father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged and do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. So you have just heard the scariest passage in the Bible. People were asking me, what's the scariest passage in the Bible? In my opinion, and it's only my opinion, that's the scariest passage uh, in the Bible. A lot of people think that the most frightening verses might be you know, in the book of uh, Revelation, for example, you know, the pit and the dragon and the lake of fire and all that business. Others might refer to 2 Peter chapter three where Peter talks about the end of the world and perhaps Matthew 24 as Jesus describes the terrible suffering and horror of the destruction of Jerusalem and, and his final coming in glory uh, and power. But these are the passages uh, disturb us because of their dramatic imagery. But since they talk about things that have either already happened or will perhaps happen in the, not perhaps, but will happen sometime in the future, it's kind of easy to blow them off when the reality of this world comes crashing in when we leave the building. Like we go, oh, wow, that's terrible. But then when we get outside, the horn is hawking and you know, the kids are yelling and running around. We get back to business and we got to get ready for work. You know, we forget all about those frightening images. But when I read chapter six, verse 27, 38 from Luke, I feel uncomfortable, I feel challenged, even frightened for very specific reasons. I want to share those with you tonight. First of all, this is a frightening passage because the demands are personal. The demands are personal. In the first few words of the passage, there is no mistaking to whom Jesus is talking. He says, but I say to you who hear, well, there are two people involved here and one implied idea. There is Jesus who is speaking and specifying that these are his words, these are his commands. And then there's the listener, the one who was there in person. And then every person who reads these words, he is saying, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking about some existential idea up there about people in general. No, I'm talking directly to you. If you're somebody who hears, then I'm talking to you. There is the understanding that if you claim to be a disciple, if you claim to be a believer, if you claim to be one who wears the name Christian, then you're the one who hears. Well, then if you're one who hears, this teaching is for you. This passage is scary because Jesus is making it personal. He directly confronts all of his disciples and he forces them to deal with what he is saying here. So I'm a little shaky because Jesus is dealing with me on a personal level. Again, this is not some sort of broad doctrinal statements open to interpretation and fine tuning. He's talking directly to me very openly and very forcefully. Number two, 
it's a little frightening because the demands that he makes are radical. You know, he's not saying, you know, it would be nice if you would be nice. <laughs> he's not saying, do your best. It's not that what he's saying. Every commentary I read about this verse spends most of the time trying to water down or rationalize the things that Jesus is saying here. No wonder, look at the things the Lord is saying uh, for his disciples to do. He's telling them to love their enemies, you know, verses 27, 35. Not just loving enemies at, like at arm's length, like you know, maybe not wishing them harm or maybe sending food packages or giving donations to people who have been at war with you in the past. You know, let's send money to Vietnam because we were at v war with Vietnam for a time or let's send money to Afghanistan because we were at war with Afghanistan for a time. He's asking disciples to love their enemies up close and personal. Do good, he says, to those who hate you. Not just people that bug you, people that hate you. Uh, bless, he says, you know, say good things about those who say bad things about you. You say good things about people who say bad things about you. Pray, he says, for those who have done bad things to you in the past. They've cheated you, they've lied about you, they've hurt you in some way. You know what, I've never seen, and I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be mean-spirited here, I have never seen a blue card come up and have one of our elders say, oh, I have a blue card here, and sister so-and-so wants us to pray for you know, sister other so-and-so over here uh, uh, because uh, she ruined her reputation or stole money from her or you know, spoke badly about her or whatever, and uh, she wants to pray for her enemy openly. I've never heard blue cards come in with us praying for people that hate us. It's okay to send blue cards in for our illnesses. That's fine, we should pray for those. But Jesus also tells us to pray for our enemies, even our enemies in general. I, ha I haven't seen a lot of blue cards uh, with prayers for Iran. Nobody praying for those guys. And yet Jesus tells us radically to pray for our enemies. Um, he says, return good for evil. You know, turning the other cheek, giving the coat. Don't demand back what is taken away from you. Resisting the impulse of giving as good as you get or getting even or not fighting fire with fire or violence with violence or cheating with cheating. He says, give to people even evil ones without expecting that they give back to you in the same way or what you deserve. You know, Jesus is commanding disciples to do this towards their enemies. That's pretty radical. In addition to this, he tells us to be merciful, verses 36 and seven. To our enemies, we should do good. To all, we should be merciful. He explains the nature of the mercy we are to practice towards all people. We're not to judge or condemn, we are to be forgiving. Sometimes our family and friends hurt us or annoy us or disappoint us. And when that happens, we're not to judge, he says. We're not to condemn, he says. We're to forgive them. Forgiveness is an automatic response that we should have to people who harm us. Loving our enemies and being merciful to everyone else is radical because if you do this, it would mean a radical change. And think about the change that would require in your life, my life, in order to you know, carefully obey and respond to what Jesus commands us to do. It removes from our lives the reason or excuse or rationalization for revenge of any kind. It makes us completely vulnerable to those who would insult us or take advantage of us. I mean, the idea is that our only response to evil is good, not violence, not threats, or worse, evil. 
I mean, we can see what fighting fire with fire has done to the political discourse in our nation. You want to see what that method yields? Take a look at what's happening in our country now. That's what fighting fire with fire yields. Fighting insult with another insult. This is, this is where it gets us, we are today. It would see us always obliged to forgive and seek reconciliation whether the other person asked or deserved it or not. That's crazy. That might work right here in the building maybe, but out in the world, man, we'd be toast. I don't know about you, but this would require a radical change in, in my own life. You see, I like to get even, <laughs> forgive me, but I like to get even. I don't want someone to hurt me without paying some kind of price. I need to feel secure that no one will insult or hurt or cheat or take my position without a fight. I will forgive, but only if the other person repents and asks for my forgiveness. Okay, then I'm ready to forgive. But the changes that Jesus asks, uh, asks for, they're radical because they strike at uh, every core of my pride and my security as a human being. They ask me to humble myself, uh, to become completely vulnerable and to take on a gentleness that is completely foreign to me. And I don't know about you, but that's scary. That makes me afraid. And that brings me to the third reason why this passage is the scariest in the Bible. It's impossible. Whew. It's impossible. We may have grasped these ideas in our heads, but have you connected with the reality of what this passage means? Can you love and say good things about people you know hate you and, and have done bad things to you? Can you do nothing if someone slaps you in the face? How about if they insult your wife? Can you do nothing? How about they cheat your child out of a deserved prize? Can you then turn the other cheek? Can you give every time someone asks, every time? I don't know about you, but I keep some small change in my car, you know, in a little compartment there, you know, because there's always some guy at the corner, you know, starving, please, I need food, we're starving to death, or homeless person, they're right on the corner, you know, and in your mind, you know, well, this guy's probably going to go out and just buy a beer, or do something nasty or whatever, you know, but, you know, you're saying, I'm thinking, you know, give when they ask you, this, so I, you know, I, I keep a little change there, you know, you know here's some change, you got a dollar bill, here's a dollar bill, you know, I feel, uh, we do that, don't we? But I don't do it every time because sometimes all I got on me is a 20. <laughs> Whoops, the light changed, sorry. <laughs> Can you do nothing if someone slaps you in the face, as I said? Can you give every time, as I just described? Can you forgive and love those who don't care if you forgive them and tell you so? It's one thing when the other person says, oh, I'm so sorry, I, you know, I, I would never hurt you. And it just, uh, I was just uh, upset and I wasn't thinking and uh, the words just came out, just please forgive me. And you, know, you go, well, okay, you know, come here, let's have a hug. You know. That guy I can forgive. What about the guy who says, I don't give a rip how you feel. Keep your forgiveness. You know what you can do with your forgiveness? Whoa. I don't know about that guy. I don't know how much I'm going to be able to forgive that guy. If someone uh, borrows something, can you not demand it back, even if you need it? Can you just say good things about people, even people you don't like? So this passage is scary because it's impossible. Who can be like this all the time? The answer, nobody. Nobody can be like this all the time. So it's pretty scary when the Lord commands us to do something that's impossible. And so if it's impossible, 
then why did Jesus say that we should do this? A couple of more reasons perhaps to carry this message along. Why did he ask us to do this? Why is this in there? Number one, Jesus is weeding out the true disciples from the fakes. It's a test, it's a screening. The person who hears these words and thinks he is already doing them or can do them is a self-righteous fool. Yeah, I can do that, no problem. You're living in dreamland, my friend. The person who hears these words and thinks that they are impossible to do and quits the Lord is one who has no faith. But the one who hears the words, ignores them, and calls himself a Christian anyways, he's a hypocrite. Because he's saying, ah, oh, he didn't really mean that. It's not really for me. You know, it's just, you know. But the person who hears the words and sees that they are beyond him or her and cries out to God for help, this is the person who truly hears. This is the person who truly understands. This is the true disciple. Can you not hear the words of the father whose son you know, was ill and nobody could cure him and Jesus says, you know, if you believe, and he says, I believe, but help my disbelief. Can you not just hear that cry of anguish from that father? Okay, I believe, I believe anything. Please take care of my son. What is he saying? I know I have to believe, but I can't get there. I can't get there, Lord. Please help me get there. Jesus gives these words to weed out the fakes, the hypocrites, and the fools. Secondly, Jesus is giving us a glimpse of the kingdom that is fully developed in us. It's a preview. These words represent a person who is totally dependent on God, totally vulnerable, totally removed from this world while still in it, totally filled with love for others without regard for self. These words show the pure spirit of Christ as He was and as we can become through Him. When He says these words, He's holding up an image and He's saying, this is you in the future. This is who I want you and who I will enable you to become. He loved his enemies, Jesus did. He gave without thought of return. He did not resist the evil he was sent to bear. He forgave those who hated him even while they were hating on him. In this passage, Jesus literally describes his own personality and the character that his disciples will eventually take on as they continue to follow him. A third reason, why did Jesus do this? Jesus is challenging his disciples to believe that with God, all things are possible, even the impossible. Things like walking on water, things like eating his flesh and his blood, things like being a man or a woman of the kingdom. In a world you know, without law and order, it would be impossible to be as vulnerable as this passage says. We'd be killed, we'd be robbed, we'd be crushed immediately. But God has provided law and government to protect and to render justice in this world. And that law also protects Christians as well. It's not perfect, it's not evenly distributed, but it's there. Christians cannot seek revenge, but they can seek protection under the law. And they have a right to a fair justice that God has provided for everyone living in this world. So we can practice the love of enemies 
and the doing of good within the context and the protection of law and order. In a world where we would have to provide for ourselves, freely giving without demanding a return would be foolish and costly. But God promises us that He will provide not only for our needs, but also for our acts of giving as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse eight. So we can practice charity with the assurance that God will provide the charity that we give. And in a world of payback, which is the only way to protect oneself in this world, where forgiveness is painful and seen as a sign of weakness, God offers His Son Jesus Christ in public disgrace as a sacrifice for your personal sins to obtain your forgiveness. This is done also as an example for you to follow. I ask you a question. Has anyone ever had to suffer as much or endure as great a humiliation as Jesus in order to accomplish forgiveness? When was the last time saying, I'm sorry, or please forgive me, or I forgive you, when was the last time this cost you as much as saying, I forgive you, cost Jesus? If you're ever in a situation you know, where someone has harmed you and you, you're, you're working on the strength to be able to forgive them, just compare what happened to you to what happened to him. Just compare how much is this costing me to forgive this person to what it cost Jesus to offer forgiveness to all, of, to all of us. And it'll get things into spiritual perspective. You see, Luke chapter six, these words are impossible without Christ, but with Christ, they become possible, even desirable, as we are changed into his character. You see, they're impossible for the earthly, human, temporal person, but these scary words become possible for the heavenly, spiritual, eternal beings that we are becoming in Christ Jesus. So, the Lord is uh, weeding out His followers, and He is continually doing this. We think, you know, while well, he was weeding out you know, the apostles and those people in the first century, you know, but the work of weeding out, of pruning, continues to this day. He prunes churches, he prunes individuals, he prunes you, he prunes me. That work is always happening. If we could just kind of get our life into this context, that everything that happens in our lives is taking place through the sovereignty and the authority and the knowledge of God. How is it serving us in our development as kingdom dwellers? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Not, oh dear, because of this, I can't do this anymore in the world, or I can't do that anymore in the world, or I can't you know, achieve this earthly objective. You know? And we forget that that's not what we're about. We're about living in the kingdom. We're about building the kingdom. Everything that happens, happens to us according to what we are doing in the kingdom. And so even this lesson is a pruning process for those who hear. So do you feel comfortable with these words? You, you people who are sitting here. Do you, do you want to quit? Does it make you want to quit? Do you even hear them at all? Are you saying to yourself, Lord, help me. Lord, let me be able to do these things. Jesus, this is impossible to do without you. Is that what you're saying? Jesus gives us a scary passage. He gives us a difficult moment, so we will be forced to let go the possible, the probable, let go the just do it or no fear attitude of this world and cling to Him in faith in order to achieve the spiritually radical and seemingly impossible things of our life in the kingdom. If you need Him for the impossibles in your life, then we encourage you to come forward now for prayer, for encouragement, for conversion and repentance and baptism, 
Whatever your need, remember, the place to come to achieve these needs is at the feet of Jesus Christ. Shall we stand and sing a song of encouragement while we consider our response? Thank you.